Okay, welcome um, to the uh, meeting of the BC Blue Chapter. Uh, tonight is the 11th of February. My name is Paul Blumas, and uh, tonight is very special. Uh, I've been involved in this for 43 years now, and so I have the advantage of of a, of a historical memory, not a, not a big one, but a significant one for, for people uh, of our time. Uh, so, in the last few days, we have seen the most spectacular developments, in my view, since uh, I was a witness to those de similar developments, or potential developments, in the year 18, 1982. That was uh, 35 years ago. And I'll go through it tonight. Now, there are, there are three developments uh, that have occurred in the last week. And, uh, and combined, these three developments are quite um, spectacular, each one in themselves, but also uh, combined, they, 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 they begin to develop give you a sense of an intention, though that intention is, is still in a very infant form. It nonetheless is indicating an intention. And uh, so I'm going to go into this and including what this might mean for Canada. Now, the first of these developments is the visit, which I was spending most of the time on, is the, is the reflections on the visit of Shinto Abe uh, for a summit with Trump. Uh, which ended um, yesterday. Well, it ended today. He, they went to uh, Florida today. But they had a press conference yesterday. And what you see emerging is Donald Trump is establishing a direct relationship with Japan. But Donald Trump is not saying to Japan, this in any way should affect your relationship with China or with Russia and so forth. In other words, you have to do what you have to do, we have to do what we have to do, we have to work together for what is good for us. This is what we're starting to see. Now, now this visit and what I saw in the press 30-minute press conference and the questions that were asked, and based on what I know, has completely shattered all previous relations between Japan and the United States. And I can guarantee you that what happened in the last few days and what's been happening and this visit by the Japanese Prime Minister has caused incredible alarms in the globalist uh, one world crowd in the, um, in the London Wall Street. Center in the uh, British Center, uh, European Center, U.S. Center, parts of the Atlantic Empire, you might call it, if you want to call it that. Um, and so first I'm going to go through some historical background, then I'm going to go through some background re related to our events in 1982 in which I was a part in which our movement was a part, in which Lyndon LaRouche specifically was a part. And then uh, I will, then within that context, you will hopefully will see how incredible this development is. Okay, now, uh, first some background historical. Okay. Uh, modern Japan emerges through the major restoration. Um, uh, restoration, uh, where essentially the figurehead em emperor became restored as an actual emperor, not the figurehead of the Tokugawa shog shogunate. And he, he created, I just got started, he created um, the major restoration created the industrialization of Japan in a very short period of time. And they did it with American advisors. 
And then when the feudal lords reacted to try to stop it, they were met with Union Army trained peasants who defeated them with modern, in modern uh, military uh, means. And the Meiji Restoration carried out that period of the Meiji Restoration uh, during that first emperor until uh, 1894 carried out the most rapid industrialization of a peasant agricultural country uh, the world had ever seen at, at that time. Now, the key economic advisor was the student of Henry Carey, who was also the, the, uh, the advisor, economic advisor to Lincoln. So they used the modern Hamiltonian uh, Lincoln style policies to achieve, I'm not going to go through the whole history of it, to achieve that, that, that rapid rate of industrial development. Uh, this was later picked up by Sun Yat-sen, who was a student of these people. He was the one who developed a plan for the full industrialization of China, which only now is being fully implemented by uh, Xi Jinping in the One Belt, One Road. So this is a, a tradition which originates in the United States, but is completely destroyed after the assassination of, of, of McKinley. And from the time of the assassination of McKinley, with the exception of FDR, the period under FDR, um, this has been buried. The US, but the U.S. benefited uh, during the World War II in terms of its industrial development and also benefited uh, during the, uh, the Civil War in its industrial development. And it followed these, strategies, these policies. Now, Japan Inc., in the post-war period, became the only country, uh, well, became the primary country that was helping other countries develop in, in that period, in the post-war period. But first they had, they had to recover from the war, and then they had to develop, and then they started developing other countries in Asia, what they call the Asian Tigers. It was the, it was the model of Japan that was the key. And a friend of ours, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mahathir, you know, said it was the only, only the Japanese that were offering any kind of uh, opposition or opposite policy to, to the colonial system that continued on. The Vietnam War was an attempt to continue the colonial system that existed before the war. So, so Japan Inc. is merging as a powerhouse. Okay? Now, the current Prime Minister, Shinto Abe, is the son of the former foreign minister, Shintaro Abe, who is the son of um, Han Abe, who was uh, a political figure in Japan who was opposing Tojo in, in the 1942 elections. In the 1942 elections, the, uh, there was a faction in Japan that wanted to end the imperial. Um, the, they didn't see it. They didn't see it working. Anyhow, so, so now the daughter of this guy, Nobusuke Kishi, uh, and Shinto Abe, Shintaro Abe, pro produced Shinto Abe. And, and this guy spent three years in a, uh, in, a, in a prison for war crimes. And he was, the, the U.S. let him out because they wanted him to run the industrial development of Japan because he was, you know, they needed, because they were going anti-communist and they needed a, a, somebody who would be, an, you know, be anti-communist and, and, and uh, fight the, uh, the socialists, right? Now, he's a very contradictory figure because he was the, the economics guy who ran the slave labor camps in Manchuco, which was a, um, uh, which was a, a phony, in the empire of Manchuco, which is under Japanese control. It, it's Manchuria. And they ran the, the, industrial, the industrial war machine out of Manchuria. They built up Manchuria, they used slave labor. They used incredibly brutal slave labor uh, techniques. But what he did was, instead of doing it through the government, he involved the corporations, the, the Japanese uh, that, uh, companies like you know, the major industrial firms that existed in Japan, which are really integrated with the government, but he started using them. And this is, this is quite a, 
Uh, but what he did is he built up the, the industrial base of, and, and he did it with something that we call state capitalism. But it was very brutal, and it, it was very brutal. And he represents a very paradoxical tradition of combining this with the imperial intention. So it's, 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 not, it's not all good, it's, but it, it has this idea of industrial development as the key, the key thing. And the way you do industrial development is you combine, you, you, have, you have a policy coming from the government, but then you in, involve the, the, all of the private sector in, in, in that. And that ultimately became the model for the development of South Korea, the development of Japan, and finally the development of China, and currently the development of, of Russia. It's do, they're doing it the same way. They're doing a private, they're using private corporations, private companies, but they're also, but they're, they're being directed by, this, by the policy of the state. And we may be soon seeing something in that direction coming in the United States. Now, he, he was a guy who, who, who wanted to be more independent from the United States. While he was good at, at suppressing the communist and the socialist tendencies, he was also for a much more independent Japan. And uh, uh, he was the one who wanted to, uh, who, he was the initial guy who wanted to change the charter, the constitution of Japan to allow them to rearm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so he, he, never re completely, he never completely repented on this whole uh, war crime business because he himself was a war crime and a war criminal. However, so you have two different factions and they, they created this guy, this guy here, Shintaro Ali, and, and, and he's, the, he's the son of that. I mean, he's the son of these two factions. Uh, now, now, to understand this, uh, you have to understand that it's very, com it's very complicated because it's this crowd that has profoundly offended the Chinese. And it's this crowd which refuses to admit any mistakes. You know, and they keep, they keep uh, promoting a, a, a false narrative about <laughs> what happened. You know, the atrocity, if they won't admit the, the atrocities that they committed. So it's a very, it's a very weird situation. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of tension between the China and Japan on this. And the, and the U.S. has been promoting this faction uh, during this uh, uh, period because they want to establish this uh, Japan-U.S. anti-China arrangement. And the Chinese have been you know, getting very uh, upset about it. So then you have the whole confrontation in the South China Sea, and it's all based upon creating in Japan this uh, right-wing nationalist factional orientation. And of course, Abe was seen as the right-wing nationalist uh, guy, you know, who's going who's to carry it through. <coughs> okay. Now, there was... Earlier in 2016, there was a summit in, <coughs> there was a G7 summit in, 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 in Japan. And a, and a huge battle broke, a huge rift broke out between Obama and uh, Shinzo Abe, the current prime minister. <coughs> the U.S. wanted uh, uh, Obama, Hollande, Merkel, the British Prime Minister, I don't know if it was May at that time. No. Huh? No, it was not. It was okay. Not. They wanted Japan to continue a massive expansion of financial bailouts, spe uh, specu uh, uh, quantitative easing. And he said, no. No more. We got to build. We got to have industry. We got to have a real economy. We can't do this anymore. And, it was, and he proposed he put on the table that the G7 go with an alternative policy. And they, and he was, I think Italy backed him up. I'm not sure. So this was a huge rift that occurred. At the same time, he began, at the same time, he started to open up uh, discussions with Putin. He went to Sochi, he met with Putin, and, the, and the, the Russians were talking about 
the development of the Russia Far East. And getting them interested in the Russia Far East. Okay. So, so that's, that's the immediate backdrop to this. But I'm going to go back now. I'm going to go back 35 years right now and give you the, 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 the backdrop from before. Okay. Um, now, this guy was prime minister from 57 to 1960. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and so, so this is, so on the one hand, you have an economic policy of economic nationalism and development. On another hand, you have this imperial tendency in Japan. It's very, you know, brutal, brutal kind of tendency. And uh, uh, so, now, so I'm going to read you from an article that was written in our publication, Executive Intelligence Review, in, in January of 1982. Now, in the late 90s, Lyndon LaRouche was meeting with all these people in Japan on these projects that we're going to talk about here. Okay. Japan's 500 billion plan to finance global development. This is by one of our people. Agreeing with West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt's evaluation that the greatest threat to world peace is the danger of a new depression, Japan intends to bring to the next summit meeting of the seven top industrial nations an unprecedentedly huge 500 billion plan for development in order to end the depression. Although Tokyo has already announced it will make a demand to lower U.S. interest rates, a subject for the coming uh, uh, G7 meeting. The administration is concerned that that is not enough. Tokyo fears that without positive measures to end current economic stagnation, the world economy will sink into the depression of the 30s and lead to war and so forth. At the summit, Japan will propose a 500 billion plan for massive infrastructure development in the developing countries over the next 20 years with projects for the agricultural industrial modernization of the third world uh, projects ranging from greening of the Sahara to massive hydroelectric and irrigation projects in the Himalayas. The purpose of the plan is to use the resulting economic stimulus to stop the world depression while avoiding the evils of an arms economy. The plan was originally developed by the Mitsubishi Research Institute in 1978 and is now being adopted by Prime Minister Zenko Suzuki as an official policy. Minister of International Trade and Industry, Shintaro Abe, this guy, uh, uh, is instructed to sound out the reactions of U.S. and European leaders during the January 14 to 15 meeting of trade ministers in Florida and perhaps also a private meeting in Washington with President Reagan on January 18, according to the Yamuri Daily. To develop domestic and international support for the plan, Suzuki set up a high-power council chaired by so-and-so, the former chairman of the Kindaren. The Japanese proposal envisions a $25 billion a year fund, including $5 billion each from the United States, Japan, and West Germany. This is in addition to the $500 billion and so forth. Over a 20-year period, the Global Infrastructure Fund would finance 12 massive projects, such as construction of new canals across Thailand and Nicaragua, uh, greening the Sahara, Sinai, and the Arabian deserts to make agriculture possible. Creation of a giant lake and use, using a dam on the Congo River to allow, this is the uh, Transaqua, immigration of the fer, ir, irrigation of the fertile Sahara area, and the massive water projects of the Himalayan area. Uh, on the Himalayan river chains to allow hydroelectric and irrigation development for the, for the entire Indian subcontinent. In the face of U.S. economic policy marked at best by negligence and worst by Volkerism, Volker raised the interest rates to destroy the world economy in, in 1978, 79. Uh, Tokyo has decided it must take some independent initiatives. Tokyo is also mindful that unless steps towards expanding the world economy are made, it will almost inevitably face trade wars echoing the tragedy of the 1930s uh, and so forth. And they, he had some support from West German Chancellor at that time, um, 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 Helen Schmidt. Tokyo believes that the industrialization of the third world is a prerequisite for restoring economic health in the advanced sector. Mitsubishi Economics 
versus Keynes and Freeman. Okay, so this is basically opposing both Keynes and Freeman. It is fitting that the proposal was developed by Mitsubishi since his business group was set up de novo in the 1870s by the founders of modern uh, Japan, specifically as a vehicle to import economics of Alexander Hamilton and, carried by, and Lincoln advisor carried to Japan. Okay. These ideas specifically counterpose to those of Adam Smith, which made both America and Japan industrial science giants. So, so this is the tradition. And, uh, and so forth. The article is quite lengthy. Now, what happened is Japan was in the 70s and 80s planning, was working with the Mexican government to develop Mexico, industrialize Mexico. Brzezinski, who was the national security advisor, who had, from whom LaRouche was hiding from a assassination order, said, we want no Japan south of the border. So the whole free trade globalization business that began to emerge in this period was a direct response to a different policy of global industrial development and developing the developing countries, the third world countries. So all these trade things, these NAFTA and GATT and the World Trade Organization, they were all done to suppress uh, the national economics and were done in order to promote what they call free trade. But it wasn't free trade. I mean it was whatever you want to call it. But it was a, it was it was a system of where where you had to take down your tariffs and allow the cheaper goods to come in and so forth. And it, it and then you put then through Volcker's high interest rates and through the oil uh, uh, price rises they were able to basically massively indebt these third world countries and, and get them strapped to the IMF. Now, in 1982, there was a revolt against this. It, it, there was support for it in Europe with Helmut Schmidt and Giscard d'Estaing in France. There was LaRouche was playing a key role with elements of the Reagan administration. And then you had a revolt in Peru, you had a revolt in Mexico, you had a revolt in the Philippines. All these countries were opposing this, po this policy of globalization and were committed to this orientation. And the Japanese were really big on this because the Japanese, they don't exist without trade. They don't exist without development. They have to develop the world if they want to survive because they're not, they're not they, you know. So, so basically, it got squashed. It got crushed. And Japan was essentially said, you, you know, we'll give you the car market in the U.S. We'll put our, the U.S. will put its workers uh, out of work and we'll relocate to Mexico and so on. So you, had to, so you had the whole transformation beginning to occur after this whole policy was crushed. And by the time Reagan was uh, in the second term, this thing was already crushed. This potential was already crushed. It was already destroyed. And uh, Brzezinski, Kissinger, all these people were playing a key role in all of this. This was a huge operation. There was also an attempt to do something similar in the Middle East called the Oasis Plan, and that got crushed too. That, that emerged in the 90s. But all of that got crushed. And then you ended up with what we ended up with, which is a, a world that, wasn't, that was not developing, a world that was heading towards wars and con conditions of, uh, and so forth. So, so this is the backdrop to, uh, to the current situation. So now what happened? Is that, um, is that <clears throat> Shinto Abe and, and, uh, said at the press conference, we're going to be building high-speed rail, maglev trains. You know, Donald, he can go from Washington to Trump Tower in one hour. <laughs> you know? And uh, that's what he said at the press conference. And then, uh, and, and, so, and, and so this whole thing is un being unleashed. And what's being unleashed? Japan. This bottled up industrial power, potential powerhouse is being told, go, help the United States develop, build hundreds of billions of dollars of, 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 of development. Russia, east, 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 eastern part of Russia. 
Same thing. So, but before that, all Japan was good for was bailing out the banks. They bailed out the banks in the late 80s and 90s with the real estate bubble, which did, they used to create the credit, and then it collapsed. They bailed out the banks through the yen carry trade throughout the 90s. They bailed out the financial system through that. They made the financial system made massive profit on the yen carry trade, and so on and so forth. And then in the last period, they've been just bailing out the system. And unlike other countries, they have a very, you know, they still maintain th their industrial core, but they created, you know, they, they, you know, it's, it's the whole Japanese society is becoming, it's not going anywhere. The pop, the youth are not going anywhere. They don't have a vision anymore. You know, they have, they don't have a vision of a, of a future for Japan as a positive vision, and maybe this will change. So anyhow, so. So now at the press conference, now the, China, the Japanese concept that they have metaphorically is the lead geese leading the flock, meaning we, we, we develop as much as we can and then we take that development and help the other geese come forward. And so now the United States has become one of the geese being led by the, the lead geese. Anyhow. Uh, so now this is not the TPP. This is bilateral. Now what does this mean? This means that there's no international treaty governing this. This is between the United States and Japan. Okay? And that's what it means. The Japan and the United States agree that this is what they're going to do and they do it. There is no, you don't have to go to the climate change people and get their permission. You don't have to go to the to the WTO and get their permission. You don't have to go to the GATT and be in line with GATT. You don't have to go to, um, you know, to the IMF or whatever. You don't have to do all of that. You just, hey, you need this, we need this, let's work together, let's, let's figure out how to do it. So, uh, now, the response from the, the London Economist, which is the flagship publication magazine of the City of London Financial Center and represent the core orientation of, uh, of, of this free trade thing. Freaked out completely uh, just prior to the meeting and they published a, a cover of, of a red-hatted Make America Great inflamed Trump throwing a Molotov cocktail. And what it said is that Trump is, is dangerous because he's operating with bilateral, bilateral. He is not going into a multilateral structure. He is going completely bilateral. Now what does it mean to go bilateral? Well, it means it's country to country. So now, at the same time, Japan is developing a great increased uh, closeness to Russia, with whom they are still at war, officially. They never resolved the, the post-World War II period. And there are these islands that they both claim called the Kirill Islands, which have belonged at various times to different groups. And when the Soviet Union offered to this guy in 1957 to give to split the islands between them, you get two, we get the red, we get two, you get the southern ones, we get the northern ones. And, and he was negotiating this. Alan Donaldson Company told him that if he did that, the U.S. would keep Okinawa. So the U.S. intervened and told the Japanese, you can't do that. You can't make a deal with the Soviet Union, like, period. The U.S. has been doing that all along, and whenever a Japanese leader stands up to the United States, in the interest of the Japanese people, there's a scandal. You know, there's this scandal, there's that scandal, and now and down goes the government. And this scandal, and that scandal, and this scandal, and that scandal. So down goes the government. So I'm waiting for the scandal for this guy. <laughs> I don't know, I, I'm waiting for it. But you gotta understand, this was the guy that they wanted in there. This is this Obama. This is the one. Of, this is the guy that they wanted with Obama and every, everybody wanted. This guy's a, this guy's gonna go to bat for 
for Japan, imperial, a, a, a new imperial Japan. And, and what did he do? He didn't do it. He was doing something else. So anyhow, uh, so, uh, so at the press conference, <laughs> the, the questioners, uh, they brought up the TPP issue. They kept bringing up, they wanted the shit, uh, Shinto Ali to respond to the TPP question. He wouldn't respond. <laughs> and then they asked, they asked uh, Trump about, uh, you know, aren't you concerned about the, the China and uh, and the uh, and 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 you know standing up to China and you know the South China Seas and all of this stuff, usual stuff. And he said, he he didn't answer that question either. He said he, that he had just had a long a long Warm discussion with Xi Jinping, and uh, and that uh, um, he said it will work out very well for China, for Japan, and the United States, and everyone in the region. Well, what what is he talking about? He's not talking about organizing Japan against China. He's talking about organizing China to give everything they can to the United States. That's a little different. <laughs> That's bilateral. <laughs> That's not multilateral. It's not geopolitical. It's not this guy against that guy. So, now, of course, the Russians are somewhat paranoid, as you would expect. So, a task, car, a task news service asked a senior spokesperson for Trump uh, on, on the reaction of the administration to the fact that Japan and Russia are coming together uh, around the Kuril Islands. What they plan to do is, is do a development zone in the Kuril Islands jointly, joint development, and then they'll talk about how they're going to resolve it later. Now why, why is that better? Because, you're pop, because you get into this whole nationalism thing, uh, you know, those are our islands, you took them from us, no, you, you did this and that, no. But if you bring about an economic relationship where you both become involved in the development of this area, then it's a whole different issue. Everything changes, you, you change, and later on you, you decide what to do as far as the treaties go. So that, that by the way, has always been LaRouche's proposal for all of these situations. You bring in the economic development first, and then you resolve all these political, psychotic political situations later. But you get everybody involved in economic development, mutual, mutual beneficial development, and then you work out the psychotic stuff later. Okay. So, <laughs> So the senior uh, spokesperson said that uh, that they understand that Japan has a neighbor and and it, that the Trump administration respects Japan's and Russia's bilateral relations and understands that Russia is a neighbor of Japan and the U.S. respects that and isn't going to interfere with obvious priorities in his uh, in his government. Okay, we're not going to interfere with Russia and China's relationship. Since when have you ever heard an American president say we're not going to interfere? That, I've never heard that before. What, oh, no, no, that's all right. We're not going to interfere. No, you're on either with us or against us. <laughs> you all heard that a thousand times. You're with us, the free world, or you're the slave world, the communists, or whatever. You know, it's always been the same. You're with us or you're against us. Yeah. You've got to choose. Well, they, they're saying to Japan, you don't have to choose. You can go with Russia, you can come with us too. No problem. So, now, um, hold on one second. Now, now the Chinese news service, Xinhua, on the 10th, decided it was time to, to give a call to Helga Zeppelin Rouge and uh, get her opinion of this uh, Trump Army meeting. So I'm going to read you this, uh, which appeared to, uh, today, appeared today, this morning, in the English Chinese uh, 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 publication. Uh, I think it's Global Times, but it's the Xinhua uh, News Service. The recent interactions between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Donald Trump, particularly their latest phone conversations, are very positive signs of the potential to develop 
a new type of bilateral relations, a German expert said today. President Trump's letter and subsequent phone call with President Xi Jinping are very positive signs that he indeed wants to develop a constructive relationship with China. Helga zeppler founder of the Germany-based think tank, the Schiller Institute, said in an exclusive interview to Xinhua. The expert said she was confident that the positive signs would help realize China's proposal to build a new type of major country relationship featuring non-conflict, non-confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. I think we are at the beginning of a completely new set of relations among major nations of the world. Geopolitics will soon be a matter of the past, how does that what said, responding to a question about the prospect of China-U.S. ties in the long run. Reviewing the current dynamics in major power relationship, Zeppelin Roos believes that a new platform of international relations can be reached based on win-win cooperation. This has the potential for a new era of mankind, the realization of Xi Jinping's vision of building a community of shared future of humanity, she says. A new paradigm, something I would call the adulthood of civilization, is within reach. So, and, uh, so anyhow, uh, we also found out that Contrary to whatever people are saying, the Chinese and the Trump administration have been have ongoing uh, dialogue going on. It's not, it's not. They they have set up uh, some kind of thing that they're talking all the time. Uh, and uh, so, so now, so, so now, what about Russia? Well. Um, Putin was in Slovenia, met the president of Slovenia, no, and it was... No, 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 no. Slovenian president was in Moscow. Well, so, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Slovenian president was in Moscow, and it was uh, discussed that perhaps Slovenia would be a good place for Trump and, and, uh, and Putin to, to meet because that's a... Neutral territory. That's his wife's territory. So that's that's. Not uh, it happened before George Bush met or somebody. somebody okay, else. it happened before. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is the kind of thing. Now, now at the press conference, someone asked a provocative question of 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 Trump. They said, "You uh, complain about the Chinese currency being overvalued," and Trump said, "Well, we are working on that." We need to get a level playing field between the currencies. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean, does that mean a fixed currency relationship between the currencies? I don't know what that means. But is he really thinking, if, he, if he's talking about a fixed playing field, you can't have a fixed, a fixed playing field when currencies are going like this all the time. you got to have a, some kind of fixed relationship. No, the speculators are free within the currency regimes and are still manipulating. Yeah. And that's what needs to come to an end. So he's, is he implying that he wants to move towards a fixed exchange system? I don't know. He doesn't know either. He may not know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know. He's not saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so now, so that's one major development. And I probably did not properly communicate it. And I, because it is, it is very significant, this situation with Japan. The, the, the box that Japan was put in, it, 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 it's now broken, they are now breaking out of the box that they have been in since the AIDS, when, when they had all these scandals over two other governments, and, and they've been in this box since the late AIDS. Okay. And now they're coming out of the box. Yeah. I mean, Japan has incredible potential for rapid expansion of exports and development and technology and what have you. Now comes the second development. Now, Donald Trump met with the sheriffs and the police chiefs at a major, at a major, and, 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 uh, and he discussed the problem of crime. But he didn't discuss the problem of crime as crime. He, he discussed the problem of breaking up the drug cartels. And he is tasking Jeff Sessions and General Kelly to do this. The, the Homeland Security and the uh, Attorney General. Now, so the Homeland Security is now being 
shifted from what it's been doing to the question of shutting down the drug cartels. Now, he, wanted, he wants in 120 days a detailed report on uh, the penetration of international drug cartels and their operations in the U.S. And he's setting up an initial task force for that under Sessions, I believe. Now, when law enforcement officials are asked, when General Kelly is asked, when says, what part of the crime is caused by drug-related, they, they all say 75 to 80 percent of the crime is caused by drugs. 75 percent of the people incarcerated are for related drug or related offenses. Now, the one thing missing in this whole thing has been the question of the banking side. Of it. Okay. But Trump said we cannot have our children being raised in a, an environment where it is they cannot be safe. They cannot be safe from drugs. He says we cannot have our children being raised in that environment. We have to do something. And Kelly said when it was hit, when it was primarily the minorities and other communities who were getting hit with it, the, the rest of the populace says that doesn't affect us. But now it's affecting everybody. And he's saying we have to do something. You have to do something. Now, we should have done something before, but now we have to do it. So now I forgot to bring, or I did not bring, the, the famous book with the with the uh, syringe needle and the and the British Crown and the Union Jack called Dope Incorporated. I didn't bring that book to show you, but we've been putting out editions of it since 1978, and in it we document it's the on inter Amazon. It's on Amazon. It, it is available on Amazon. The newer, the, the newest version. Yep. Yeah. And. We've been documenting the inter interconnected relationship between the financial side, the marketing side, which is the cultural side, the distribution side, and the criminal networks that develop as a result, and, and, and so forth. And one of our collaborators, who was formerly the head of the Russian anti-narcotics program, Viktor Ivanov, you know, he always has been saying, you can help wipe out a large part of the drug traffic if you implement Glass-Steagall. And, you, you, and so doing, you also create a transparency. Uh, you'll uh, add that to it. So we have a track record, a history of being, of, of being uh, uh, we put out a magazine called uh, uh, War on Drugs for a while. We, we got hit very hard for doing that. I mean, that's when they really came after us. When we did the book and the War on Drugs and we exposed it all, that's when we got hit really hard. Our organization got really smacked hard, uh, and uh, and and uh, also the UN commissioner on this, uh, Mr. Costa, has also been been doing a lot. He's now no longer the UN commissioner, but he's been doing a lot on this. And so, the, now the drug thing is very serious. It's civilizational. It's threatening the existence of Russia. It threatens the existence of the United States. It threatens the existence of third world nations. It, ha it has to be dealt with. If you want, if you're serious about anything, you have to deal with it. Now, um, George Soros is a big promoter of not only the legalization, but but not just the legalization of marijuana, but also the legalization of everything else. And he has been, and he's one of the recipients. His financial empire is. Or laundry mat. I shouldn't call it a financial. It's a laundry mat. They launder the stuff into the political realm, and and they're funding. They're not just funding the the people who are demonstrating against uh, a Trump. They're funding uh, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. They fund it all. Yeah. You know, yeah. this, if you want if you want uh, money and you're willing to do do their job, they will give you money. There's there's plenty of money. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. It's there for you. And uh, so now, um, <coughs> now the disrupt thing is very serious, and um, the only way you're going to shut it down in Mexico, in 
Afghanistan, you know, once it hits, once it gets inside a country, whether it's, it's too late. You, it has to be an internationally coordinated effort. And, and so Kelly is now talking about very close cooperation with the Mexican government and very close cooperation with the countries surrounding Afghanistan, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries. Why well, you want to you want to wipe out the poppy fields? Well, you got to pull together all these forces, and 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 you can do it. You can offer the Afghanis a way a better life, and you know. So this is what's being being discussed there. Now, uh, so. So if you're if you're serious, this is what you have to do. If, you, if you're not serious, you, that, you can say all you want. You can have a war on crime. You can have, you know, we're going to develop the country. It means absolutely nothing if you do not take on the thing that's going to uh, keep people backwards. The thing that's going to destroy all these children. It's going to destroy all these people's lives. It's going to prevent people from going forward. It's, 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 it has such a depressing effect on the communities of, uh, of, uh, of the world now. And uh, so this is, you know, so this is part of it. Now, the third thing that happened is that um, Trump had a meeting with the airline executives. And he told them that they need, we need to modernize the whole airline's uh, port, the airline uh, ports and uh, uh, facilities. Transportation. Yep. And transportation. And he says... We're going to have high-speed rail. How much high-speed rail does the United States have? Nothing. And we're going to do it. And it's going to be done. That's what he said. And, well, who's, who's coming in to help build that right now? Well, Japan is one of the countries that's going to help build it. I suspect, potentially, China will be the other country. I don't think so, Paul. No? I think uh, Japan is politically acceptable, geopolitically. Okay. China's not. China's had opportunity bid on the one in Mexico, bid on the one in Vegas, and they've been they've been booned all and blocked. I mean, they they've had to go ahead to build those high speed. Just they're not none of them. They have none well. Okay. Yeah. And there's no goodwill. There's no goodwill there. Can't do it. So okay. So they'll they'll give point. They'll they'll give the job to Japan and yes, and give the rest of the world to China. Yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe that's that's probably right. I don't know. Well. Yeah. So that makes it, sense. As good as it gets. So, now, I, I recall a mobilization that our movement was on. We talked to a lot of the auto people. We talked to the unions. We talked to the, the congressmen. We had a certain amount of head of steam on this. When the auto industry was being dismantled in 2003, we proposed to save all of the plant and equipment, or primarily the space, to retool the machine tools that were going to be thrown away or, or sold or whatever for building high-speed rail maglev trains. So we went on that campaign. We, we, we put together legislation for it. We went all out on it, and we didn't go nowhere. This was in the Bush administration. So this is, this is, you know, this is, this is now, the President of the United States is now saying that's what we're, is going to be done. So, now, 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 earlier in January when um, Xi Jinping went to Davos and spoke about um, the need to go for accelerated advances in science and development and, and everything, he proposed that all the nations come, as part of the One Belt, One Road, come to the One Belt, One Road conference in Beijing in May. I don't know the exact date when it's going to be. Putin has already agreed. 20 heads of state has agreed. And we have a, a Chinese uh, scholar with one of the major think tanks in India has indicated, and this is not public, has indicated that Trump is planning to come as well. And if Trump shows up at the One Bell, One Row major conference in Beijing with 
putting his seal of approval on the whole thing and being a part of that, if that should happen, and I'm not saying it will, but there's, there's rumors that that is going on, then that will be huge. And uh, it will be a, a starting point for, some, for a whole different world. And uh, so we have to ask ourselves the question of intention. If you want to bring jobs and development, what do you do? You have to, you have to develop. How are you going to develop? Well, you have to work with these other countries. You also have to take on the drug trade. If you have instead a post-industrial neo-Malthusian world where the world is overpopulated and you know we're already we don't need development, you know we got to save the planet from from uh, climate problems, etc. Then what do you do with your life? Well, what difference does it make? So it doesn't make any difference if you get rid of the drug trade. People have a right to their entertainment. People have a right to their recreation in a post-industrial world, because what, what's the point? You're not going to develop. Development, what, why do you want development? The world's already developed enough. So, if, you, if you're going to develop, though, you've got to have to do something, you have to do something about this. So there, is a, there seems to be, uh, at least on, on some level, a sense of intention being, get, beginning to become manifest. But that doesn't mean they're going to be able to do it. But it means that there seems to be a, 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 a sense of intention. If you want to develop a skilled workforce and you want people to be productive, you have to give them a future. They're not going to become skilled workers and become productive if there's no future and everyone, you know, their children are being turned into drug heads. You know, it's just not going to happen. So if you're going to go in this direction, you need a change in the educational system. You need a change in, in a lot of areas. Oh. Is that where Trump is going? I don't know. But that's, there are indications that that may be where he's going. Can you demark development clearly for people? Because I think a lot of people get confused with development. Right. They think of real estate. They think of right, right. corporate moguls. You know. OK. Development means. Uh, uh, development means an increase of density of economic activity per per square kilometer, let's say. You know, it's a density. It's an increased density of uh, per square kilometer. It's not increased density of real estate development. It's, it's no. manufacturing. It's, um, it's, it's the productive power of your nation. Like, we have all this real estate development, but we don't have the productive power that, that a, a China has or a Japan has. You know? And that's what economic development means. Economic development means, means that you no longer have to boil your water in order to drink, have water to drink. Economic development means that you can flush the toilet and not have, you know, and, 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 and have a sanitation system. Economic development means that you have electricity. Economic development means that you have, you have, you have human beings able to sustain a lifestyle that allows them to not only be productive but, but to live live, you know, much longer. You know, I could go into more detail, but, but economic development also means an increase in the in the power of your economy productively. And uh, there are certain uh, parameters for that. We can talk about that later. But, but it's physical economy that up uplifts humanity. It, it's a physical economy, yeah. yes. And it's real production, not, not yeah. unproductive, like finance. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. And and and, and from a from a productive standpoint, the United States has had a net negative production since the seventies. U.S. reached its peak at around the seventies. That's why you don't have 
modern rail systems. That's why you don't have uh, um, the kind of infrastructure in the United States. It's all falling to pieces, basically. Yeah, it's all falling to pieces because, because the, the peak was reached in the 70s. And there's been a net loss per capita in the productive power of the United States. And I would assume also, I'm, I'm not for sure about Canada, but. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. Canada as well. Absolutely. In 1970 was the time okay. when... So, 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 so there are people and imperial system. Now, you have to understand, if this is what tr Trump is heading towards, he is going against the power that exists. Whether he's doing it right or he's doing it wrong, he's going against the power that exists. And they are not going to just lay down and let, let, let it happen. So we now have a color revolution being set up inside the United States. Uh, that color revolution is coming from, the, from uh, two quarters. One, and, and current, three quarters. One is the 16 Democratic state attorney generals at the state level who are now preparing massive legal actions against Trump for whatever pretext on whatever he does that may or may not be um, in the uh, interpretation. Uh, his executive order is no good. Well, you know, it's, that's against the Constitution. Or this is against the Constitution. That's against the Constitution. Well, everything that the Bush and Obama did in the last 16 years, was most of it was against the Constitution. So you could have impeached all of them based on that. You could still, so I mean, it's not, so, so now, so, so, um, so that's, and that's being led by the New York uh, uh, State Attorney. Now these are, these are the, the, the chief law enforcement, uh, not law enforcement, yeah, the chief law enforcement uh, legal of the states. Yes. And they have prosecutorial powers, so they can prosecute all kinds of things at the state level. So this is getting going. Then you have a massive media campaign which is, a lot of it is just, they just twist this, and he did this, and he said that, and he didn't really say that, but he said, he, you know, it's just, it's just constant. The latest one was that uh, Kellyanne Conway said something stupid about the fact that Nordstrom's is, is shutting down, you know, Ivanka Trump's line, and that's a conflict of interest. Did you say by uh, Ivanka Trump's? Uh, yeah. <laughs> products and she, 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 she doesn't know it's unconstitutional or whatever. She's yeah, yeah. stepped down a line. Yeah. Yeah, but but the point is, is anything like this is going to be used. It's just it's just and then and and and, there's, and it's and it's growing and people are hysterical. There's a whole crowd of people who are hysterical now. The, the game plan. Okay, so that's one aspect of it. Then that is vectored into the Congress where you have Pelosi and people like her, people like uh, the, the head of the, the minority uh, ranking member of the banking, of the finance committee, um, Maxine Waters, they're, they're, they're mooting impeachment right now, impeachment. Okay. Now, the way, they're, the way they're trying to control the situation, the way they're trying to set this up is they want to bushwhack Trump from two different directions. One is the whole... Um, Democratic an angle. And then the other one is the Republican angle. So the Republican angle is, you know, you're soft on Russia, you're committing treason, uh, you, won't, you won't confront Russia, and, and this stuff hasn't been resolved, okay? The thing with Russia has not been resolved. There's still stuff going on in Ukraine and the mm -hmm. politics and stuff like that. And then the other, so, so they confronted uh, him, on, they confronted Trump uh, on, on uh, O'Reilly report before the Super Bowl, they played it right before the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, so you're willing to work with this murderous murderer. Killer. Uh, killer. Killer. Putin. Putin's a killer. Putin's a killer. Putin's a killer. Putin killer. Putin killer. Right? And Trump said, what makes you think we're, we're not, we're so innocent? And, and that, that was unexpected. Totally. That was unexpected. And then all, all these people said, that was the most deprecated thing he ever said about the United States. Treaties. You should be impeached for that, you know? So this is the kind of... Bro, he said lots of killers, lots of killers. Lots of killers. <laughs> he said lots of killers. Yeah. 